Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to session number 32 of our study of Revelation. And it looks like we're only going to have uh, two more to go before we wrap this study up and start something new. All right, <clears throat> let's begin with the prayer. Thank you, Father, for this time that you give us to come together and fellowship one with another and explore your word. Thank you for the things that you've left there for us to discover. And we ask your spirit to open our minds and our hearts to the things we'll see here this morning, that they might become a source of blessing and challenge. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> in our last session, we have looked at the world of the kingdom of millennium, uh, its government, and how man would function in it, including the relationship between man and God with Jesus Christ present on earth and reigning. We have seen it is an entirely different world that mankind has been accustomed to since the garden. We should also understand that the kingdom millennium is the seventh and final age or era or period in Satan's appeal trial and the culmination of God's plan for the redemption of man and the recovery of all that was lost in the garden. Though the church is a major player in God's plan, it should be understood that his plan is primarily Israel-focused, and what we see in the kingdom is the fulfillment of promises made to Israel, the national entity, through whom God has been relating to mankind throughout much of human history, at least since uh, Abraham. The kingdom will include the fulfillment of promises made by God specifically to Israel. As such, the kingdom should be viewed as mainly Israel-centric. However, the church will share in the promises and blessings of Israel to the kingdom because of our status as sons of God and co-heirs to the promise. It should be understood that the church has not replaced Israel and never will replace Israel. God has a plan for both entities. That was a bonus. There you go. My promises, I am referring to specific covenants God made with Israel. They're five in number. Four are unconditional covenants, meaning God ob obliged himself to deliver blessings to Israel with no preconditions demanded of Israel. Israel needs only show up at the appointed time to receive the promised blessings of the covenants. The fifth covenant is a conditional Covenant, meaning God and Israel are both obligated to meet specific performance standards under the terms of the covenant. That conditional covenant is the Mosaic covenant, which is sometimes called the law. And it is temporal rather than eternal, applying during the age of the law and not in eternity. In simple terms, it was a system to manage the state of Israel and the individual Israelites' behavior and demonstrate the perfect righteousness of God as the standard they must meet. Compliance with the covenant stipulations by Israel would result in blessings from God. Conversely, if Israel failed to meet their obligations under the terms of the covenant, it could expect to receive discipline from God, including the possibility of being removed temporarily from the land. Since the standard to meet is the perfect righteousness of God himself, he understood they would inevitably fail to meet that standard. With no aid from a universal indwelling of the Holy Spirit during that age, Israelites had only human effort hobbled by a sin nature, to meet the terms of the covenant. Thus, God made provision for the Jew to find judicial blamelessness under the terms of the covenant through animal sacrifices for their sinfulness. They generally failed and found themselves booted out of the land twice, the most recent expulsion lasting 2,000 years. 
In contrast, the unconditional covenants require no reciprocal actions by Israel. God said he would do whatever it, he, it was he promised to do, period. Israel had only to be there to receive the promised blessings when they were to be distributed. They are national in character and relate mainly to the nation itself. They will be delivered only to regenerate Israel and ultimately be fulfilled during the kingdom. It was these four unconditional covenants that Satan, by his scheming during the tribulation, attempted to prevent God from delivering. Satan reasoned if he could eliminate all Jews from the face of the earth, then none would be present to receive the promised blessings. That would make God's promises all lies and he would thus be unfit to sit in judgment on Satan. Satan's plan failed, and it was a remnant of believing Israel that survived the tribulation to receive the blessings of the four unconditional covenants in the kingdom slash millennium. A brief review of these four unconditional covenants, I think, is in order here. The first is the Abrahamic covenant. It's originally stated in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, and reiterated in Genesis 13, 14 through 17, 15, 1 through 21, and 17, 1 through 18. The Abrahamic covenant includes certain individual promises to Abraham and the seed of Abraham. This includes certain national promises and hopes that God would make Abraham's seed a great nation, would bless those that blessed him and curse those who cursed him, grant land to his seed, and kingdoms would arise from his seed. Then we have the Palestinian covenant, which is stated in Deuteronomy 31 through 10. It's a land-grant covenant and expands on the promises to Abraham that his seed will occupy the land and be blessed in it. This promise will ultimately be, ultimately be fulfilled in the kingdom. Then we have the Davidic covenant. This is seen in 2 Samuel 7, 4 through 17. Again, expanding on the Abrahamic covenant, God promised King David his house would endure forever, his throne would endure forever, and his seed would sit on that throne forever. This is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ at the second advent and resurrected David acting as regent during the kingdom. And lastly, we have the new covenant to Israel, which is seen in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. The new covenant takes the blessings, promises of the Abrahamic covenant and expands on them. This promise a promise will be fulfilled only at the conversion of the nation at the second advent. Among other things, it promises a deliverer for Israel that will turn away ungodliness, circumcise their hearts, take away their sins, and put a heart for God in them. Ultimate fulfillment will be in the kingdom with the presence of Jesus Christ reigning as Messiah King. <laughs> All of Israel's national hopes are based on these four covenant promises. It was Israel's expect, expectation these will be fulfilled during the kingdom. They were waiting for the kingdom in the first century. John the baptizer warned them to repent of their sins and prepare for it because the kingdom is at hand. And Jesus offered offered it to Israel, but they rejected the king and killed him. Thus, the kingdom offer was temporarily withdrawn from Israel. The spiritual aspects of the kingdom, however, were then offered to the Gentiles to provoke the Israelites into jealousy. Israel has been under discipline for their failure for the last 2,000 years, and the tribulation will be the last seven years of that discipline. It will also be God's judgment on a fallen world. Christ's return at the second advent will terminate Israel's judgment and usher in that period they have waited for, the kingdom. Regenerate Israel will receive the one they pierced as their Messiah with the promised kingdom. All right, any questions on that before we 
continue with our verse by verse. All right, moving along, I think I'll pick up in uh, Revelation 21. And as we resume our verse by verse study in Revelation 21, we have seen the conclusion of the tribulation. We have seen life in the kingdom millennium. We have seen the Gog and Magog revolution, the judgment of the Antichrist, Satan, and the fallen angels, and the last judgment, which includes all the laws. Now we're going to look at what comes after that. God's plan of redemption has come to its ultimate conclusion, and we are about to enter eternity. At this point, all believers throughout history are in their glorified resurrection bodies and finally free of their sin natures. All unbelievers are residing forever in the lake of fire. There is one final act by God, and that is to restore earth to its pristine condition as before the fall. Revelation 21, 1. And I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. The opening verse of chapter 21 describes the creation of the new heaven and the new earth, which chronologically follows the 1,000-year reign of Christ described in chapter 20. This new creation is described as a new heaven and new earth. This is a totally new heaven and new earth, and not the present heaven and earth renovated, which is supported by the additional statement for well, the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Some expositors argue this is a renovation, much like the flood, but by fire this time. However, the Greeks suggest otherwise, and the Old Testament, and in the Old Testament, Isaiah 65, 17 refers to this new heaven and new earth and uses the Hebrew word bara for create, which means to create something out of nothing. That suggests whatever previously existed was not used in the process of creating the new. An amazingly small amount of information is given about the new heaven and the new earth. The new heaven refers not to the abode of God, but to earth's atmosphere and planetary space. No landmarks are given concerning the new earth, and nothing is known of its characteristics vegetation, color, or form. One major fact is stated in the verse that there is no longer any sea. In contrast to the present earth, which has most of its surface covered by water, no large body of water will be on the new earth. There will be water and probably some significant bodies of water, but no expansive oceans as we have now. A few other references are found in Scripture concerning the new earth, including Isaiah 65, 17, 66, 22, and 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13, which states merely, the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. We are left to understand only that God will create a new earth with its atmosphere and related heavens. the New Jerusalem. We look at Revelation 21.2 now, and it says, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. John sees the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. From the text, this city appears to be floating above the new earth and coming down out of heaven to its surface. We get this tantalizing glimpse of this new Jerusalem here in verse 2, but no more details until we get down to verse 9. And we'll pick up this subject of the new Jerusalem when we get there. Meanwhile, verse 3, Revelation 21. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them, and he shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. 
and he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall no longer be any death. There shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, It's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes shall inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We get this five-verse statement that the tabernacle of God is among men. He'll be dwelling among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. And there will be no more tears. The first things have passed away. All things are new. And he, he who overcomes will inherit these things, etc. Expositors are split on exactly what period this is describing. Some say it's a picture of eternity, yet others say it is a picture of the kingdom millennium. Are these passages and the description of the New Jerusalem that follows in verse 9 looking at events after the creation of the new heaven and new earth, or is it looking at events during the millennium? There are good arguments by highly respected expositors that we have here taken a step back in chronology of Revelation to the beginning of the millennium. Verse 3 through 8 can easily be seen as speaking of conditions during the kingdom. It should also be noted that he who overcomes in verse 7 refers to believers and carries no works-based connotations to qualify the overcomer. In verse 8, we have a reference to the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all, all liars, and will not have a part of the blessings described in verses 3 through 7. They will face the second death in the lake of fire. The presence of this reference to the lost has prompted some expositors to argue that these verses should be seen as during the kingdom. In eternity, all of the lost will already be in the lake of fire. However, more likely the reference to the exclusion of the loss here is to merely emphasize the perfect righteousness of this time and this place we call eternity. Revelation 21.9, and one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, came and spoke to me, saying, Come here. I shall show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. The bride, as the resurrected church, first shows up on the scene with Christ at the second advent. And here, it seemed to be saying we're seeing her for the first time. That suggests this is not eternity, but we're looking at events that follow closely the second advent into the beginning of the millennium. Furthermore, verse 9 mentions the angel associated with the seven last plagues of the tribulation. While not conclusive evidence, this also suggests Revelation 21 is looking at events soon after the tribulation that are associated with the millennium. However, historical Middle Eastern tradition holds that when a king entered his capital to rule or ascend his throne, it was seen as a marriage, and he was wedded intimately and permanently to the city or to that throne. That's the more likely way we should view this. Coming right after the creation of the new heavens and the new earth and the description of eternity, the context suggests the resurrected church as the bride of Christ is not specifically in view here. The angel of the seven bowls is showing John the new, new Jerusalem in which the king is to be wedded. 
Revelation 21.10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. The angel then takes John on a trip to see this new Jerusalem. Thus, it does not seem that this particular angel has any significance beyond what is stated in this passage. This new Jerusalem, the bride, as a domain for the king, is pictured as coming down out of heaven after the old earth has been destroyed and the new created. Thus, we should conclude that the pictured events are relating to eternity directly and only indirectly to the kingdom and millennium. Verses 21, 11 through chapter 22, 5 describe this amazing city. But first, let's look at some background relating to the New Jerusalem. References to it show up elsewhere in scripture and often in words we might not have connected with what we will see here in Revelation 21 through 22. Let's look first at Hebrews 11.8. By faith, when he was called, by faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in a land of promise, as in a foreign land dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs to the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Let me say that again. He was looking for a city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Hebrews makes Oh, Hebrews was written primarily to the Jews, specifically Jewish believers in Jesus as Messiah. It spoke to those believers using terms and ideas they would particularly relate to and understand. It must therefore be interpreted in that context. Abraham was called by God and went to a place of blessing, that's the land, as directed by God. He did this on faith alone. He didn't stop and ask God for clarification and proof, except for a brief pause and one, and one point of disobedience regarding God's instructions. Abraham eventually did what God told him to do. He entered the promised land and was blessed for it. But there was something more he was expecting. In verse 10, the writer of Hebrews makes a strange statement that Abraham was looking for a city that has foundations. And the word translated foundations is the maleos, which primarily refers to laying down the foundation of a building, but can also be used metaphorically as beginnings or first principles of an institution or system of truth. I believe the intention here is the primary different, uh, definition of the construction of a physical city, and God is both the architect and the builder of this city. The writer of Hebrews is adding to the Abrahamic covenant some details not previously mentioned in Scripture. We are to assume that Abraham understood the meaning of this. He was looking to the day when he would find this real physical city that was designed and built by God. Then we look at Hebrews 11.11. 11. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, 
they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to call to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Note verse 13, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. Old Testament believers died without having received the promises, but only saw them from afar in their faith. What promises? They were desiring a country of their own where God is not ashamed of them and has prepared for them a city. It seems verse 16. The implication is that the true blessings are not earthly, but heavenly, and they are to be found in a city prepared by God. Then let's go down to Hebrews 12, 18. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels and festival gatherings, and to the assembly of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Verses 18 through 21 are a vivid picture of the fearsomeness of Mount Sinai, where the Old Covenant, that's the Mosaic Covenant, was given to Israel. It is described as a blazing fire and darkness with gloom and a tempest, and it could not be touched. Moses trembled in fear of it. In the next three verses, we see a contrast to that under the New Covenant. Moses went to Mount Sinai, and it was fearsome. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and found the new covenant is quite different from the old Mosaic covenant. This city of the living God, a heavenly Jerusalem, is inhabited by myriads of angels and the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. This does not refer to the church but to all those who are under the new birth. God, the judge of all, will be there, and the spirits of righteous men made perfect. Perfect is often interpreted as made complete, and I believe it has that connotation here, as well as perfected in glorified form of the resurrection body. And Jesus, the mediator, who made all this possible, will be there. We have a city inhabited by angels, the elect and resurrection bodies, and Jesus, and it is a heavenly Jerusalem. The individual Jew was to expect that his blessings would be fulfilled in this heavenly Jerusalem. And we have Hebrews 13, 14. But here, we do not have a lasting city. But we are seeking the city, which is to come. The city of the Hebrews on earth was not a lasting one, but they're seeking a lasting city that is still yet to come. Then we have John 14, 2. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. These are words Jesus spoke when he was going away. House is okia in Greek. It means house, home, or household. It can mean a palace or a mansion. Dwelling places is mone, and it means a mansion or abode or dwelling place. 
This is clearly an unusual and very fine place as suggested by both the Greek and the translation. Jesus has gone to prepare a grand apartment for us in heaven is a way most look at this verse. But when we view it in the context of the Hebrew passages and references to a heavenly Jerusalem, we suspect it might be more than we first thought. It appears that there is an actual city where Abraham and his descendants were looking forward to living in it, but they died before realizing that promise. It is a fantastic city designed and built by God and occupied by God, Jesus Christ, angels, and all those who are saved. Then we have 1 Thessalonians 4.13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. This, of course, is our famous rapture passage that we are all familiar with by now. But note the last part of verse 17, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Once raptured, the bride shall never be separated from Christ. He has gone to prepare a place for us in his father's house, and Hebrews suggests this place is a real city called heavenly Jerusalem. We know the church returns with Christ at the second advent and lives and reigns with Christ during the millennium. What happened to the place Christ prepared for us in his father's house? We have Israel looking for a city built by God in which they will live and the church being promised we will never be separated from Christ who is our bridegroom who has gone away to prepare a place for us in his father's house. Do you think we might be looking at the same place and we're seeing it in Revelation 21 and 22, the heavenly or new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven after the destruction of earth and the creation of the new earth? The scriptures have surprisingly little to say about this heavenly or new Jerusalem until Revelation 21. You would expect more would have been said of it such, such an important place. In Revelation 21 through 22, passages about the New Jerusalem speak of it in the context of eternity. Revelation 21 begins with passages relating to after the millennium, after the Gog and Magog, Mog, Gog and Magog revolution, and after the last judgment, and after the creation of the new heavens and new earth. The scriptures never directly, directly mentioned it in the context of the millennium. Otherwise, we're left to infer from the application of other doctrines and the few passages that mention it before Revelation 21 that the heavenly or new Jerusalem is indeed present during the millennium. Before we look closely at the city itself, let's examine the evidence to suggest it's also present during the millennium. We have seen that it is the abode of resurrected believers. It is the house of God where Jesus went to prepare rooms for us, that is New Testament believers, and the city built by God that Abraham looked for, Old Testament believers. We know that Jesus is present on earth and ruling during the millennium. We know that once raptured, the bride, that is the church, is never again separated from the bridegroom. So not only do we return with Christ at the second advent, but we must reign with Christ during the millennium. 
church age believers and old testament saints and tribulation martyrs are present and reigning and judging with christ during the kingdom millennium there is a legitimate question <laughs> of how might these glorified and perfected saints be able to freely commingle with mankind who was still in his human body and still influenced by his sin nature. True, Christ was able to do so after his resurrection, so maybe it isn't an issue. Maybe the solution to the problem of intermingling resurrected believers with people still in their human bodies is their interaction is somehow limited. Maybe the resurrection and glorified believers do not actually live on planet Earth, and logically, they might live in the New Jerusalem, assuming it's present during the kingdom millennium. Because there is still a Jerusalem with a temple from which Messiah reigns on the high mountain during the kingdom, it is assumed this heavenly New Jerusalem is, is suspended above the surface of the earth, as suggested by Revelation 21.2, lots of speculation here, but it's the best we have to go on. Some read this passage in Revelation 21, and even though the context places it in eternity, they feel that John has shifted back into the millennium in his vision. A couple of points in the passage suggest the possibility that is indeed a vision of the heavenly Jerusalem during the millennium. This chronological shift theory is not a foreign concept to Revelation. Revelation does shift around in chronological order in some places. We know from Revelation 21 and 22 that the heavenly Jerusalem is present and in proximity to the planet Earth in eternity. If it is our heavenly dwelling place built by God, why would it not also be present during the millennium? Many expositors have concluded that though it is not directly mentioned in Scripture in conjunction with the millennium, that it is indeed likely to be present hovering over planet Earth during the 1,000 years of the millennium. This heavenly Jerusalem is not only our appointed dwelling place in eternity, but also during the millennium. There is no evidence in Scripture or compelling argument to suggest otherwise. Is Revelation 21 and 22 picturing the new Jerusalem in eternity after the creation of the new heaven and new earth? Or has John shifted back chronologically to the millennium? The most likely conclusion is the former. We are seeing this new Jerusalem in eternity. However, we must conclude that it is also most likely present during the millennium as the abode of the resurrected saints. And that, my friends, concludes our study for this day. Does anybody have any thoughts or questions? The first thing that comes up, Lane, is uh, why destroy the old heaven? Why did the old heaven pass away with the old earth? We know the earth is corrupted. But isn't heaven have been corrupted as well? Now, I don't think they're referring to God's heaven. I think they're referring to the heavens, the atmosphere around earth and the and possibly further out than that. Uh, it's not clear, but I, it's pretty clear in my mind that it's not referring to God's abode. And God's abode technically has moved anyway. It's, he's going to be living in the um, New Jerusalem. Yeah, and I guess I, I struggle with that. I, I, I'm not convinced one way or the other, but when you hear, I, I can understand the new earth being done. It's hard to understand why there would be a new heaven unless it is just the first atmosphere above earth. Uh, but it could be even his heaven was corrupted. One third of the angels went against him with Satan. 
And angels were given free will, just like we're given free will, either to follow God or follow Satan. So is he destroying both creations and starting over from new? That's what entered my mind. I'm not saying that's right. It's just that's the picture I got as we went through this. Uh, I, I, I don't think that's unreasonable at all. I think it's entirely possible that that what you're saying is accurate. Um, and on the surface, the scriptures seem to be referring to that. Um, but most expositors don't go there. Um, and when you stop and think about it, if God's going to be living in the New Jerusalem, then why is there a need for this place we call heaven? Right. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? From some other study, maybe? If, if the New Jerusalem is visible to the earth dwellers during the millennium, it seems like they would see that it would be almost like us seeing heaven right now. And, you know, sin would just be thrown out of the window because we probably want to be part of that instantly be part of that. You know, if we live eternally right now and look at heaven the way that it is, um, and it seems like the earth dwellers, there's going to be sin on the earth. Um, the, those who are sinful, will live to be only maybe a hundred years is what, what the scripture says, a hundred years old. But I'm just wondering if the earth dwellers can see the new Jerusalem and see the rewards that God has for us, why would there be sin? <laughs> I, <laughs> your question, I think is a valid one. And it's, it's unfathomable to us from a, a rational point of view. Also keep in mind, Jesus Christ is present and reigning on earth and visible. Yeah. Um, all the things that about scripture are, have come to life and it's real during this period. And you'd have to wonder, like you said, how would sinful man not respond to that? And I think the answer is, is found two things. One, I think most sinful men do respond to it. The, probably the majority. That's speculation. Of course, scripture doesn't specify that. But the other piece is, and we discussed this in a previous session, about the iron scepter of the rod of iron rule. Very strict rule of Christ. Sin is not going to be tolerated. The angels lived in the presence of God, yet they revolted. So, it's not inconceivable that there will be some men who are going to, in spite of all this that they have during this time, balk at this iron scepter rule and say, you know, Satan's idea is better. And that's thus you have the Gog Magog revolution at the end of the um, millennium. But yeah, it's it's hard for us to get our head around that idea, but we're believers. Are you you think there's a suggestion here where you're going? I want to make sure I got this clear. I think maybe I do, but I'm not quite sure. At the time of Gog and Magog, and we have the establishment of the kingdom, the establishment of the kingdom for the millennium is Israel focused. It's to fulfill the promise that God made to Israel, and it has to be done. But at that same time, was there a new heaven and new earth created? And the two are simultaneous. We stay in the new heaven and new earth. Christ comes to rule down on earth for the new kingdom. At the end of the kingdom, we're all back together. Is that kind of what you're suggesting, is that the new heaven is actually, and the new Jerusalem is created at the same time as the millennium, one housing us and the other housing Israel? Short answer is yes, I believe that the New Jerusalem is present during the millennium. And I believe, as Ron's question, that it is visible to those on earth. Yeah. Um, 
it is a resident residence of resurrected saints, um, Jesus Christ, etc., during that period. And I would I think it the conclusion we might draw, which the Bible does not clearly state, is there's commuting going on between the new heavens, I mean the new Jerusalem and earth, and the actions that um the jobs that some believers have on earth, managing cities and countries and um, acting as judges. I think the same might apply to Jesus Christ, that he also computes, uh, commutes and doesn't spend 100% of his time on earth, thus separated from uh, his people, his bride. And the bride, at least some of the bride, is also going to be present on earth, too, in this speculative speculative commuting scenario does that make any sense yeah it does to me i i i, I kind of lean that way even though that's not a, a way i looked at it before so this is new to me i have to noodle on it well scripture's silent on it doesn't give us the hard answer and we we can only speculate on some of this stuff and we may be speculating completely wrong right <clears throat> okay, anybody have any, any other questions or comments? I, I don't think God's omnipresence and Jesus's omnipresence will end during the millennium. I think it will still be, he will still, he's still an omnipresent being, whether he's in a physical form or the spiritual form. That's you true. Know, on earth, he... Um, you know, I'm sure he'll be in physical form, ruling as a, you know, sitting on David's throne. Um, and yet he's still the, the spiritual in his spiritual form is an, an omnipresent God. Yeah, we tend to try and put him in a box <laughs> and we can't. You're right. The box is a whole lot bigger <clears throat> and there are no boundaries to it. Good point, Ron. All right, if there are no other questions or comments, we will close with a prayer, and um, I will see you all next week. As a friend of mine says, God willing, and the creek don't rise. Thank you, Father, for this time that you've given us to study your word, and thank you for the marvelous things you've left there in your word for us to discover. Thank you for your spirit that makes these things perspicuous to us that we might take them and use them in our own lives. But we ask you, Father, that uh, as we come bring these things to mind during this week, that your spirit open our minds and our hearts and that they all become a source of blessing and challenge and that we might be witnesses for you in Satan's world. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah.